cool. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for helping me with my project. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about yourself. Sure, my name's Jeff Eby. Um, and I knew Nathan back when we both worked at Compact Computer Corporation. And uh, I am uh, 64, approaching 65 retirement age. Uh, in fact, I am about to be retiring in about four months and uh, kind of looking forward to the next part of life. But uh, the interesting thing is, uh, having been born in 1955, a long time ago, uh, got to see pretty much the entirety of the U.S. space age as it unfolded, and especially a lot of the a lot of the stuff around uh, Gemini and, and Apollo and uh, space shuttle missions. And uh, to me, the the whole thing with the space age and some of the earlier NASA missions, um, as well as some of the stuff that happened as the space program kind of went on pause due to budget and other restrictions has been kind of both the vision and some of the failures to achieve some of the successes that they wanted, some of the trade-offs made, and I think uh, some of the lost opportunity because I'm a big believer in uh, the fact that I think staying where we are on our single planet is not the best use of uh, dollars, nor do I think it's, I think we're made to explore, and I think there's a whole bunch to explore out there. So that's kind of, kind of me. That's awesome. So you were either 13 or 14 whenever uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out onto the moon. Yes, I was able to watch it. And uh, what was that moment like? Um, I, that was about six years before my time. So I. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those kind of where were you, of course, moments when it happened that you'd never forget. And there's been, unfortunately, both good and bad on those in my lifetime. Uh, I think um, the magnitude of, of the success and the fact that we hit it, given my age, was kind of like took it for granted. It wasn't until later I realized the complexity and also just, <laughs> just how much everything had to go right for that to actually work and happen. It seemed like a logical progression between the Gemini to practice, which was basically the maneuvers needed to support the Apollo mission were rehearsed on Gemini, especially the docking uh, piece of it, which was critical. They couldn't do uh, the Apollo mission without the ability to dock the spacecraft. And uh, so the Gemini missions were always the predecessor, but were based upon what they needed to learn in order to do Apollo. So to me, growing up with it, it seemed like logical progression, and that's how it was done. As an adult, much later on, when I became more interested in the Apollo program and the kind of history behind it, the technology behind it, little did I know just how many things could have gone wrong and just how risky uh, the endeavor truly was. Uh, they, they really, it, it, it still is an amazing accomplishment what they were able to do. So you've actually seen every single crewed U.S. vehicle take off from uh, Mercury all the way up to uh, and yesterday the SpaceX vehicle. I have seen examples. I haven't seen every shot, of course, but I have seen examples of uh, every vehicle that went up, yes, including first launch of Mer Mercury, first launch of Gemini, first launch Apollo, uh, walk on the moon, uh, first launch space shuttle, and now the SpaceX. And how does it make you feel kind of going from the space shuttle to something that looks more like a Mercury capsule? Right direction. Space shuttle was a, a waste. It uh, never achieved its goal of reusability. It was basically a custom rebuilt, you know, space airplane was how it was described. It never fulfilled that function. It was basically custom rebuilt every single time it flew. Um, yes, you had reusable technology, but the cost to reuse it was astonishing. And I consider the space shuttle a, a failure on multiple points. It could only achieve low Earth orbit. It uh, had a lot of restrictions. Um, the costs were, were huge. Uh, 
and it basically required so much investment. It basically pulled the U.S. At, to keep the shuttle program going, pulled the U.S. out of just about every other uh, necessary thing, including our development of booster technology, which because of the space shuttle, we, we ended up uh, not pursuing any, any further for what you would call the capsule approach. We, we lost the ability to do that. We couldn't even recreate Apollo technology after the space shuttle. We had to relearn all that technology from scratch, which is why NASA ended up using private company technology because they lost the ability to create the, the booster technology themselves. And what do you have any opinions about the SLS that's being built to take uh, astronauts around the moon and the vicinity of the moon? I don't think NASA is the right approach. I respect what they've accomplished, but bureaucratically, they they have traded off the vision and to get there uh, and take risks with the bureau bureaucratic approach of do no harm and make sure nothing bad happens that bureaucrats won't get blamed for. I think the inertia of NASA has hurt them. I think it became apparent during the space shuttle years and the warped priorities of the space shuttle over everything else and NASA's willingness to go down that path, I think um, left me doubtful of their ability to f successfully execute anything uh, that has any degree of risk and is willing to push the envelope. The it, It's clear reusable space boosters coming out of SpaceX, the ability to reland and reuse the booster, you know, NASA should have had that long time ago and they chose not to go down that path again they they ignored boosters they ignored a whole bunch of unmanned just to keep the space shuttle program alive and that's bureaucratic decision making uh because the space shuttle was what would keep nasa alive not necessarily what was the best direction for uh, space technology overall have you been following uh, spacex's development of the starship in boca chica texas I've read a little bit about it. I haven't been too interested. They're partnering with Boeing on that one, right? I know it's, it's strictly SpaceX all by itself. SpaceX? Okay. Yeah, I've read a little bit about it. Uh, that's the the next generation that they're trying to create uh, to be able, I think, uh, for SpaceX, Musk is talking about going to uh, Mars, right? That's, that's the, uh, that's the techno next level of technology to go to Mars. Exactly. And they're also creating a, they've been selected by NASA as one of three teams to create a lander that's based upon the same uh, technology to land on the moon as well. So, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, SpaceX is certainly good. I think there's some other vendors out there that are also incrementally building. SpaceX obviously has huge momentum right now, and uh, they're the first one to achieve manned flight capability. Uh, versus just booster technology capability for unmanned flight. Uh, but I think kind of the genie is out of the bottle, and I think all the others will catch up fairly fast. Just because once you know someone else can do it, the rest will follow. Um, it's kind of... The, the challenge has always has been... Uh, Everybody thought, because all the ones that got into the, the space technology as far as private industry thought, we'll just throw money at it, just like we did for the software companies that most of those billionaires created. It's just a matter of applying the technology, and NASA's stupid, and they didn't know what they were doing. We're, we're better at that, and we'll be able to do it. Um, actual booster technology and building things with a lot of propulsion actually is very, very, very hard. And uh, even SpaceX's approach, and if I recall correctly on the Starship, it's multiple rockets tied together to provide enough energy. And uh, instead of being able to recreate like the uh, engine that, that Apollo had five of to, to boost up, uh, that kind of technology is just unbelievable engineering to achieve and very expensive. So it it's kind of, how do you scale to get enough energy to lift the payload you need into orbit to, to do the work you want to do? And I think having many different approaches for it, testing and trying, 
we'll prove which ones are the best. Uh, NASA's approach was obviously worked. It got us to the moon and the technology of, I think it was the F1 engine for Apollo is just, I mean, we can't even, we couldn't even make it when we wanted to restart that technology. Everything was gone and recreating it was impossible. So what they've been doing is trying to, you know, come up with something similar, but not identical. Uh, I, I just think overall, it's not just the technology, but it's the willingness to try different avenues and approaches and let's see which ones work. Yeah, you really need somebody that has uh, a vision and vision in order to execute, you need faith and bureaucracies are completely against faith. <laughs> um, so, did you know that we were going back to the moon in 2024? I know that's a goal. Do I think we would, do I think it will hit the moon in 2024? No, we're not going to do it. I bet um, money right now we will not hit the moon in 2024. Uh, no, we won't, we feet, won't even be in orbit. And uh, in in that uh, assessment, are you also including uh, like SpaceX's independent efforts? Or yep. Uh, do you think it'd be shortly after 2024, or this is all just sort of a mirage? No, I think the moon. We've been there. <clears throat> I think Mars is what people are going to go after because we haven't been there. Uh, if the moon helps us get us to Mars, great but those are two different types of approaches and technologies needed. What gets us to the moon doesn't get us to Mars and vice versa. And so I think um, they may go back to the moon and they can re recreate the technology, but we already know how to do that. There's nothing on the moon that makes sense to go there and find um, in any great degree. I'm not opposed to going to the moon. I think any space exploration program is good. But I view it as if we go back to the moon, it will not be manned, it'll be unmanned. And unmanned exploration of the moon won't capture the imagination of, of the public to any great degree. I think, um, I think it'll be Mars, I actually do. Uh, now you mentioned that you didn't see any reason to go back to the moon uh, because there's, there's nothing on the moon that we need. I was also wondering if you're including like the, the frozen water ice that's suspected in permanently shadowed craters on the poles. Um, if you thought, you know, that might be a strategic resource in terms of getting your, your water uh, for rocket fuel and uh, water for your astronauts and for other things, um, a lot easier to lift that off the moon than it is Earth. I was wondering what you thought about that. No, I, I mean, no, I don't think that's necessarily easier. I get it's a, it's a source and potential, but I think the effort to detect, mine, and get insufficient quantities off the moon uh, will be a challenge. Uh, I, I just, yeah, I just don't see it. Uh, I, I just don't think, you know, the, it, it's like you're layering in another layer of complication. I think... Uh, getting to uh, sufficient Earth orbit in order to do it uh, gets you to Mars just as fast as it does to the moon. Once you're in orbit, when, once you're out of the Earth's gravity well, it gets you to Mars just as fast. M having water and less technology changes in order to do something that makes more sense. Um, and one of those might be you need a barrier shield of you know ice and water to help protect you from uh, solar um, radiation bursts or something like that. But I think there's other ways and technologies of dealing with that. And I do think anybody traveling on a long voyage to Mars will have challenges. Excuse me a second. Oh, no worries. Um, well, what do you think about uh, maybe mining resources on the moon to build solar panels that are used for large space-based um, solar arrays to boom, uh, beam uh, energy down to Earth. I mean, it seems like the, the moon has a lot of, lot of resources that could be used uh, to build up space infrastructure. 
uh, that may not be necessary for us to go to Mars, but uh, might be useful in its its own its own right. I was just wondering what you thought about about that. Nobody's going to support large scale beaming energy back to Earth via microwave. Period. Uh, it's too close to death ray, and nobody's going to trust it. I think um, it's one of those things that scientifically has been proofed out. They're doing, I think, a proof of scale testing of beaming mi using microwave to beam energy back for retrieval and reuse from solar uh, in, in Earth orbit. Um, but large scale, enough energy to make a difference, nobody's going to trust to beam that much energy back down towards the Earth because it could be used for other purposes, good or bad, and uh, it's not a classic death ray, but in a lot of people's opinion, it'll be a bit death ray, and I think politically it, it will not be feasible or so. Now, uh, back in 1969, whenever Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin first stepped on the moon, there were three network TVs. Everybody pretty much read the same papers, and it was literally an event that captured the attention of the world because media was so... Um, uh, uniform, maybe, uh, or consolidated. But now, in today's world, everybody gets their personalized news feed. Um, I've talked to lots of people who had no idea that there was plans to go back to the moon in 2024. Uh, and I feel like that even if we landed people on the moon, there would be large numbers of people that wouldn't even know about it just because it wouldn't ever show up in their personalized news feed. I was wondering if you had uh, a different assessment of that. And you know what you thought, um, if, if we actually did land people on the moon, would it be a global event like it was in 1969 or have things fundamentally changed that uh, it just won't really register? You can see the history of that with, um, who are the names of the last crew that landed on the moon, Nathan? I don't know uh, them. Harrison Schmidt, he was the only geologist, became a senator uh, for the banking committee. Uh, and there was one other, uh, I forget the second. Uh-huh. But that's the whole point. We've already done it. And because we've already done it, public attention moves on to the next new thing versus not doing something again. Uh, that hurt the Apollo program and ended up with cancelization of some of the subsequent missions because of loss of public interest and the need to fund the shuttle um, because of budget cuts happening. So, you know, yeah, we can go back to the moon, but we've already done it. That's why I'm thinking Mars would definitely be more interesting. I think interest wise, yes, because you just saw that with the launch yesterday, there's huge public interest in space program. And I think it captures the imagination just like the original Apollo program did, but the destination has to be something new. But, you know, in your opening comments, you talked about the need to be able to expand the presence of uh, humanity beyond the Earth. Yes. Uh, and while we've, like, visited the moon, we haven't really developed any space-based resources, uh, which would be necessary in order to actually allow for humanity to expand off the Earth. And uh, what do you see as being sort of like the steps to, to get there? I mean, to actually have people living in semi-self-contained communities that are expanding that aren't on Earth? That living in communities isn't the goal. Um, so I'm, I'll be really, to me, the goal is what resources are out there that it makes sense for the time and material and risk to go pursue outside the atmosphere or on earth. What do we run short of? Where are the risks? Where are there opportunities to do things that make the most sense? And I believe that for us as a species, I think there are a lot of things out there. And I think what I would like to see is a program to get to Mars, because then we're deep space versus Earth in Earth orbit and the moon around Earth orbit, but extending beyond the orbit of Earth out to the uh, deeper space of the solar system is the key technology. 
once we develop that capacity that we can go to Mars, we can basically go anywhere in the solar system. It's just a matter of time. And to me, the, the real benefit would probably be more in the asteroid belt. And that's kind of where I see the future being than anything else. And uh, potentially Mars, I think, might catch for if they, they discover enough out there in Mars to be interesting. Uh, that people may want to populate Mars and do research there, similar to what they do in Antarctica and other places, that the science in Mars probably would be a lot more useful. I don't think there's a ton of science to do on the moon. I think there's a lot more science to do on Mars. And uh, again, I think once we have the, the ability to get out there easier at a, at a different cost factor, that makes more sense. But I think the real benefit will be the asteroid belt. And, and maybe the moons of uh, Jupiter and the moons of Saturn and even further. <laughs> what is it? Uh, Arthur C. Clarke thought that there was a huge diamond at the you know, bottom of uh, Jupiter. Uh, you know, the core of Jupiter was a giant diamond or something. Uh, there's some interesting things out there, but uh, no, I think we'll find it as we go. I, I just see it as there's, there's a lot of material out there that I think we can uh, benefit from, a lot of exploration. I think it makes sense. But I also think the idea of it being manned versus unmanned, I think one of the challenges has been uh, we, it takes a lot for a person to get out there and the robotics and the uh, automation that we have in place uh, basically can help on a lot of the pieces around it. Uh, getting further out and doing exploration with stuff. Uh, you look at the uh, Pioneer uh, ones that went out, uh, very old technology, still communicating amazing design work to, to last as long as they did. Uh, first man-made objects to leave the solar system. Um, I think that uh, we had in today's technology versus something designed back in the 60s, launched in the 70s. Uh, you add kind of today's technology on top of that. What more can we learn and, and gather? Um, I think uh, the whole Hubble Space Telescope and what we learned from that, hugely advanced science um, in ways more than I would say the last few lunar missions did, right? For bang for buck, you got a lot more out of the Hubble telescope than you did anything else because it was above the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so to me, I think it's just a lot of science out there, not necessarily manned expeditions. And um, if it was safe and affordable, would you have any interest in going into space yourself? No. Um, do you think uh, like your children would or? Um... Not my children. Uh, I don't think either of them are. Uh, I, you don't have to go yourself to be excited. I, I think it takes a certain certain people that are willing to commit and they already have people signing up for like, I would like to be on a Mars mission, land and be there, right? And if I don't survive, I don't survive, but I'd like to try and be there. So you got certain people that are willing to take those risks. I'm not one of them, <laughs> and uh, that's okay. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that um, yeah, I do think there's enough people out there that want it that that it would make sense. But uh, I mean, like even to orbit for maybe a few days, um, that would still be um, as something that you would think would be too risky as well. It's not risk. It's, I guess it, it's down to what I'd like to see the view from, you know, climbing Mount Everest and make it all the way up to the top. That would be a tremendous view. Relatively speaking, as far as expense and risk to life, Going to Everest is roughly akin to doing a multi-day space hop on a platform if it's reliable enough. I think it would cost about the same per person. You could probably afford to do it. Um, but I haven't done, I don't want to do Everest either. And I think it'd be a cool view, but it's not a cool enough view for me to go up there. There's 
plenty of good pictures and I can see it from that, you know, doing it myself. Just because I see it doesn't mean I have to do it myself. And I'm a, I'm a sci-fi fan. I, spaceships, you know, I, I grew up uh, with 2001, a space odyssey coming out in 1968, informing me what we should have been on the moon like already with Tycho crater base and everything else. And yeah. Uh, so today's technology doesn't interest me because I was so immersed in tomorrow's technology that isn't here yet. Uh, would you say that the last uh, uh, 50 years have been somewhat of a disappointment from a space exploration standpoint? No, I think NASA was a disappointment. I don't think the last 50 years in general has been. Um, I think the focus on low Earth orbit has been short-sighted, but we've accomplished a lot being in low Earth, low Earth orbit. Uh, Freedom Space Station has some remarkable components there, and some of the stuff they've done there has been pretty amazing. International cooperation on space makes sense. I do believe that um, some of the uh, probes we've had to Mars and all those have been uh, caught the human imagination as well. And the rovers on Mars have really fired up a lot. And I think people, again, I, I keep going back to Mars. I think there is an interest in, in doing more there because we've already reached it with unmanned. So I think reaching it with man makes sense. Uh, in terms of uh, the last 50 years, I think the pause has been waiting for the technology to catch up. It was a big player game that you had huge one-time use rockets, very expensive, and took basically government structures to be able to do it. Bringing in private industry brings in different cost constraints and goals and opens up for different approaches and technologies, some of which will work and some won't. Uh, but I do believe that eventually the, the cost will be lowered. And we got to get better at being able to get up into space. I think uh, the, the third factor I see, and uh, I think it's the highest risk, is uh, we have way too much debris in low Earth orbit and too many old satellites no longer in use and too many pieces flying around up there. Picking windows to launch into orbit is becoming more and more challenging with the amount of uh, stuff flying around up there. And I think that uh, to me, um, the biggest risk we have is not so much we can't do more, it's getting safely out there because we've kind of polluted near Earth orbit so much, uh, it's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. And we need the technology to lift up and at least be able to clear some of that or else we're going to find ourselves landlocked again and we won't be able to launch safely at all, uh, you know, because of all the debris up there. Uh, so, I mean, it seems like uh, SpaceX is startling constellation that's going to be like thousands of satellites. Uh, it seems like you would have some concerns about that too. Um, I mean, it'd be that constellation alone will probably eclipse every, the cumulative of everything that's already up there. Yeah, I, we have no easy regulation on it, and it's becoming increasingly hazardous up there. And they, that's there's a reason why Soyuz is attached to Freedom, and it has nothing to do with Freedom itself failing. It has to do with they're worried about a collision. And uh, I think definitely um, that uh, was a Gravity, uh, that movie where everything hit world. everything else yeah um it, it's kind of an exaggeration and the orbits don't match that you can jump from one to the other to the other the way that they did in the movie but uh the the realistic possibility of collision and the violence of the speed that they're actually traveling against even a small item uh that kind of reflects kind of the risk and danger it doesn't matter who puts what up there none of it will work if things start ricocheting around up there and i think the the fragments themselves will eventually go into the atmosphere, burn up, but it takes a very long time for, for that to clear out. We need to get better at technology and ways to do things up there. And 
Um, you know, the uh, geosync orbits especially are going to get increasingly crowded. They already are uh, with uh, more and more nations wanting to leverage that for their own needs, uh, both military and non-military. Yeah, I mean, just keeping track of the uh, public satellites is hard enough, but whenever you mix in, you know, ever-expanding U.S., China, India, Russian, um, you know, military satellites, it just, yeah, I mean, those are purposely meant not to be tracked. Right. Um, so I've talked to a number of people, and not everybody's as enthusiastic as you and I are about going to space. And there's basically, their reasons fall into two categories. Uh, one category is, why are we going to space when we have all these problems on Earth, like um, the environment and poverty and healthcare? And I was just wondering uh, what your thought is on that. That's classic. Um, there's two dangers, right? Uh, the first is exactly what you said. So these are all solved. Why would you waste your time on that? The flip side of it is, if we can do this, go land on the moon, why can't we do anything, right? The two traps out of uh, the space program, because neither one is realistic in my mind. And I think uh, to answer the first, which was your question, uh, why would we do that if there's not other stuff out there? I think, um, A, I believe we're species meant to explore. I think we love a challenge, and I think uh, there's more out there to find. And I think as we get deeper into science and learn more about the world around us, we find amazing ways to solve problems that uh, we need to solve here on Earth and view things with a different perspective. People forget this. I, I kind of... Um, on Facebook posted this today as uh, kind of my thought against the uh, success of the SpaceX mission. Uh, but one of the largest benefits, if you talk about what was the biggest benefit of the Apollo program other than just, yay, we landed on the moon and we beat the Russians, uh, you know, uh, go USA first. Uh, when, once you get past the, the national goal of it, you say, overall, what was the biggest impact of the Apollo program? Most will say it's microelectronics. Um, just, uh, you know, the miniaturization of electronics, which uh, the Apollo program, especially because it costs so much to, to lift weight up into orbit, uh, really, really, really pushed and accelerated. Uh, and I would say that's a huge benefit. Yes, it, they did pay for that. There's a lot of foundational technology developed by NASA that later had wide applications. But I think as a species, the biggest thing we did was take a picture from lunar orbit of Earth over the horizon of the moon. That photo is so famous and it's called the big blue marble. And I think it showed for the very, very first time the entirety, because it showed the entire planet, not just a portion that you see from orbit, the entire planet. And how fragile and how much we all are together on that single planet. And I think that's the kind of perspective we need as a species to mature. I think that's the kind of mindset we need and we don't get that if we stay locked competing on Earth, going after earthly things. It, it just broadens our horizons that there's more out there for us to tackle as a species. And no, I don't think we're going to be one government, one planet or anything like that. But I think acknowledging that we're all together on the same planet, the same lifeboat, the same thing, I, I think that picture did more for us as a species than anything else out of the space program. I truly do. Maybe that view is one of the things that we get from the moon. Yeah. If people... <laughs> you don't get in near Earth orbit. You only get a portion of it. Yeah. I, and it's interesting, you know, in addition to like uh, the view of humanity, it also gave us a view of how fragile the Earth is as well. You know, within a couple of years of that picture, uh, we had our first Earth Day. The EPA was founded. Uh, and there was a big environmental movement that uh, really... Um, some people say was maybe inspired or at least encouraged by that picture that you mentioned. Yeah. 
And that kind of feeds into the second argument that people have against us going to space, which I find kind of ironic. And that is, um, we've already messed up the earth. Why would we go mess up the moon too? Because we can. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that, that's a cynical of, approach. No, um, the, the idea that we've messed up the earth, I think, is, is funny because the earth is fine. The earth hasn't been messed up. What we messed up is our ability to survive as a species Oh, the way we've been able to survive um, for quite a long time, uh, we are, we're, we're forcing adaptation to happen at a faster pace. Uh, technology both gives and takes away, but uh, you know some of the, some of the stuff that uh, we're worried about in terms of the environment getting warmer and some of that stuff. My view has always been we're a very adaptive species and we can continue to grow. There's a lot of growth left. Um, we are able to survive as a species quite variably. Um, we've lived in hotter climes. We've lived in colder climes where we're pretty tenacious. And the number one thing that we need to get better at is the ability to effectively generate and use power because access to power is what brings you up to avoid some of the pollution. If you have ex extra power, you're able to do things to eliminate pollution. And that's where some of the stuff benefits out of the space program. Um, more microelectronics and stuff like that basically help. But uh, the most expensive real estate on the planet today, if you go by per square foot, what it takes to produce, the most expensive real estate on the planet is to build a modern um, data center. Uh, the cost per square foot for a data center because of all the heat required because of the uh, volume of compute capacity that you have per square foot in these modern data centers today. It is the most expensive uh, real estate on the planet to build a data center these days. Uh, it, it's when you look at it that way and you think, what's my cost per compute capacity and how am I applying it? That is, I think, the scariest part of what we face more than uh, the environment, because if we don't maintain the ability of power and compute capacity to solve problems, yeah, I think we will have problems. Uh, so uh, space program will help us on both because I believe it provides a goal and we work towards that goal and the, the results will benefit in both those areas for both power and compute. Even though I said, we're not gonna do microwaves back other low cost power technologies may become available because you're going to need something other than solar once you leave Earth orbit. If you're going out into deeper space, solar does not provide the power it does by powering uh, the Freedom Space Station. Now, um, you talked about not beaming the power back to Earth, and you also talked about maybe through our development in space to create another source of power, but uh, you kind of danced around one thought I had, which was what about putting the data centers in orbit and you use the power right there? Yeah, the, the cost to do that and the benefit will be interesting. At some point, there will be an intersection point where the cost to lift that much up and the benefit you get out of it, uh, I think will, will pay off. Hmm, my phone's talking to me. Great technology. Uh, what's, What's interesting to me, um, if you take a look at the design of the Freedom Space Station, though, why, what's the biggest challenge on Freedom? It's not power. Uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest challenge, is it radiation? No. No. Um, heat, dis heat dissipation. Uh, look at the hmm. technology in Freedom and how they dissipate the heat. Their biggest problem is staying cool. Heat dissipation is the biggest problem of, for the space station freedom. And uh, they use a very complex ammonia-based system to dissipate the heat off of it and circulate it out to radiators to radiate off the heat. Uh, it has to be reliable. It has to uh, you know, be able to work long-term, be a very, very efficient on uh, how well it works. And uh, 
you know, those kind of challenges, I think, are, you know, some of the more interesting aspects of it. So you imagine putting compute power into space in a data center, heat dissipation becomes even more challenging. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of pieces as you start pulling the engineering thread back, it becomes very, very interesting. And we don't know what we don't know. Um, this past week I was reading, um, got interested because I was flipping through and uh, the old Biosphere 2 experiment. I don't know if you remember that one, but that's where they went out in the Arizona desert and built this facility designed to be completely isolated from Earth's uh, ecosystem and recreate a brand new ecosystem inside these buildings and duplicate different aspects of Earth's ecosystem and try and live in it for two years and maintain it. Uh, Self-contained ecosystem outside Earth's primary biosphere ecosystem. Um, and they ended up uh, running out of oxygen and ended up having very high amounts of carbon uh, dioxide because they just didn't know how to do it uh, very efficiently. We can we can build uh, ships and able to manage to maintain air and do things like that, but they all have limits. We can't build yet an ecosystem that's stable over a long period of time. And if you want to live elsewhere, like on Mars or somewhere else. Uh, that that's also going to become very very important to be able to do that kind of stuff and As we learn more about how to do that that benefits back again against overall um, Keeping our planet healthier we learn better how we relate to our own ecosystem and how to better manage it That's a very good point uh, somebody pointed out that the if you're rebreathing your own air uh, drinking your own pee and you're stuck in a can uh, you're probably more environmentally conscious person on Earth, you know, refer, I think an astronaut said that or something. Um, well, Jeff, I really appreciate your time. And um, I was wondering if you had any additional comments in, in closing. All right, so I'll, I'll just say um, there's a lot of books back in the 80s and 90s, back as the uh, Apollo program started winding down and people started noticing we we're turning back from space and just focusing on near Earth orbit. Um, one of the people I read a lot of during that time frame, um, and I actually enjoyed reading, uh, was a writer uh, named Jerry Purnell, um, who since passed. He's also pretty famous for a series of science fiction books. Uh, especially with uh, co-author Larry Niven. Niven and Purnell wrote some very, very famous science fiction works together. But um, as a science writer and space enthusiast, he wrote a bunch about the potential and opportunity out there in space. Uh, those kind of frame my, my viewpoint uh, in terms that I think we need to get out there further, and I think staying in Earth orbit doesn't work. We gotta we gotta develop capability to go beyond Earth orbit. That's why I'm more bigger fan of Mars than than the Moon, and I think that's where our future lies. Well, I really appreciate your time again, Jeff, and uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.